Saracens are playing London Irish and they'll say to you, look, we're that, that squeaky guy in the scrum cap. Then. Who's the squeaky guy in the scrum hat? <laughs> <laughs> you a big telephone voice on you, surely. Who's the squeaky guy in the scrum hat? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> oh, JP, JP, Reese, Reese. No, I, call him, I call him Sir, actually. Crouch, bind, set. Joe presents the House of Rugby. So we are just a couple of days away from the biggest game of rugby since the Rugby World Cup. A Lions decider. Shawnee, are you nervous? Excited? I'm I'm calm at the minute now. But I would have been a lot more excited an hour and a half ago when you were meant to turn up here. And What are we doing today and why are we late, by the way? Uh, I was on a boat at Cow's Week. It was very kindly taken on a boat with uh, me and my girlfriend. And uh, yeah, lovely day. Unfortunately, I can't... Uh, predict the winds and it was a bit light on wind out there so we got it was a bit slower the course than we suspected so I came you back a bit sa- later you were actually sailing then yeah we were actually sailing yeah mm. I was only really there to do winch, winching um, obviously the big arms that I've got so enough about that Shawnee here on the House of Rugby powered by Vodafone we're going to get into Gats' six changes Ken Owens comes in Wynn Jones Ali Price Bundyaki Josh Adams and Liam Williams and on the bench Finn Russell Adam Beard and Sam Simmons come into the 23 you were there in 2013 against the Aussies. Um, they levelled up the series and Gats made six changes. What was the reaction from the players then? We probably knew it was coming, to be fair. Um, and again, I suppose, like we spoke about last week, we knew that we knew he was going to make changes this week. It's um, He has to do something. Um, he said himself during the week they want to play more. Um, so it'll be the lads after that second test. It's, it's a funny one because you know when you lose a test that something's going to be different and there's the places are back up for grabs so they would have been disappointed and then some lads would have been um, on edge for a few days and that's that's the way it was back in 2013 I see that's even the way it was in 2017 um, at certain points in that tour so he's made a few changes he surprises with a few things I think um, it talked to us about that because we both thought the front row would stay the same and two changes there straight off straight off the bat. Yeah, I think he's gone with Ken and, and Win Jones because of the relationship to have. And the other thing is, I was I was kind of thinking about this during the week, was that Cowan Dickey is probably a better impact player in terms of when the game opens up a little bit more, he's probably more of a carrier, um, you know, he's more of a footballer. Um, and Ken can mix it physically... You know, his darts are good, he's a great relationship with the boys in the front row, great scrummager. So I presume that's that's one of the reasons why Wynn Jones and Ken are, are, are starting together. Um, and then having no second rows on the bench at mm. all for the first two tests, and the Adam Beard comes in and he changes it up with no uh, no tag burn and Sam Simmons comes on the bench, no yeah. Falatau. Well, I, I think he's gone with Adam Beard because he's the biggest lock we have in terms of weight. I think that was a big, big thing last weekend. Um, he's so important. Someone big and heavy is so important to that scrum. And as you've seen, as the game went on last weekend, it started to crumble and it started to crack. So I think that's why he's there. I still think um, Ian Henderson will be massively disappointed because he's more of a footballer, more of a power player. So if he's talking about punching holes and playing that extra little bit, it would have been a tight call between them, but Beard Beard got the nod. So hopefully we see what he's done in a few games has been <clears throat> pretty good. So hopefully we see him on the field and, and bossing it. And then he's gone with Toby completely out of the squad and put Sam on the on the, on the bench. And I think that'll add another another dim- dimension to it if we play rugby. If 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 we're in an arm wrestle, it's not going to add much. It's not going to add value to the whole team. If 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 the game opens up a little bit, he's the man you want there, running in the wide channels into a bit of space, and let him do what he does best. Do, do you think there will be a, a change in the game plan because of the new faces, or do you think it just has to be in order to win? I I think I think it has to be in order to win. I think if them to obviously match the spring box physically, but secondly, move them around the place, make them work hard. Um, you know, we the Lions are perceived to be fitter, um, you know, more mobile, but we haven't done that yet. We've tried to play them at their own game, aerial battle, one-off runners around the corner. So we need to play a little bit. And I think, I think the squad he's picked for this test, um, you know, can play. And I think that's why he's picked who he's picked. You know, Ali Price is back in there. Um, you Finn on the bench now as well to come on and, and add a little bit of spice to the whole thing. So so for me, um, I, I understand why 
they're, they're, they've, well, uh, they've got Ali Price, they've got uh, Finn Russell. I personally, I don't get why they haven't put Ali Price on the bench to come on with Finn. He's played with Finn for six, seven years up at Glasgow. He knows him well. Finn hasn't played a Lions test before. Why not bring them on together? We talked about partnerships in the front row. We talk about combinations in the centres who know each other. Why not keep a 9 and 10 who, who know each other so well and bring them on together? Uh, it was a big thing for me. But um, obviously no Farrell uh, and Murray on the bench. Um, I think I'm happy with the centres just because as the, Lions, as the Lions need to get over the game line. And I feel like it's a good way to use Henshaw slightly wider, trying to punch holes. And then also Bundy just to really fly over the top of Pollard. Um, and, and Ryan Ark will be at nine. Um, for me, um, very happy to see Liam Williams there. Mm. Um, I just think the aerial game, we've talked about it so much, and his relationship with Josh Adams is so important. But um, that's, that's the most exciting one for me. I think Liam Williams will be chomping at the bit this week to prove you know, that he should have been in that team somewhere in the first two tests. He's that type of competitor, as well as Josh Adams, massive finisher. Um, Duhan's done well to keep his place at all because if 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 the Lions are trying to play a little bit more, why not have Anthony Watson there? Light and quick feet, um, exceptional like broken field runner. Um, so there's a few things there, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what Liam Williams brings. Obviously, bang on about it, but I think he he he's got the potential to really open the game up with with his line breaks as well as just the aerial ability and attack and defence I think is so important interestingly with, with Duane van der Merwe I think I was pretty quick to criticise him uh, or look at thought he was pretty lucky to keep his place but looking at some of the stats I think of all the uh, kicks that he's contested uh, 11 it is the, the Springboks haven't won any of them but one of them so every time he gets up and competes he's a nuisance he's causing problems and he's taking his, his high ball so I can see why they have kept him. I thought yeah. Watson would stay there. Um, but I think, it, you know, away from individuals, I think, pretty simply, we need to get parity in the set piece first and foremost, and we need to win the aerial battle. If we do that, then it's not really a wor worry for me about going wide or being more expansive. Those are the key things. This whole series has been a territory battle. If you get into the opposition half, you can play a little bit more or get three points mm -hmm. and you build the score. If you get stuck in your own half and their set piece gets on top or their aerial game, kicking game gets on top, you just can't get out of your half and that is the problem for this. Yeah, but I, I still think it's a tricky one because we haven't done that well in the first two tests in that aerial battle. Obviously, we've uh, a new winger and a fullback coming in now to, to see what we're able to do, but... In general, I think we just need to, regardless of playing a wide, wide, ex expansive game, I think we just need to keep the ball and bring them through phases. Make them make them work. We, I don't think the, the Lions have brought them past like 10, 11, 12 phases and seen what, seen what happens then. Because they will cough up penalties, they will become tight and D. So they haven't really tested this unbelievable defence that the Springboks have, or had, perceived to have, have at the minute. But we haven't tested it. And just... Tell me how you think the whole game is going to go. Give us not a prediction, just how you'd like to see the game go for the Lions. How 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 the best case scenario is. I I think I think early on I think you'll see the Lions trying to play a little bit more possession wise, um, and not kick it back to them straight away. But if we're not going anywhere, if we're, if we're losing collisions, I think with the team we've picked, we might be on the front foot a little bit more. But definitely like. Offset piece, off line out. I'd like to see a few breakouts, getting Bundy into the, into that seam early on, and getting getting boys on the on the move around the corner. You know, little tip ons inside or outside, and then let the backs let the backs have a crack. Like have a crack at least at them early on and see what they see what they bring. Um, so I think that might be the the case early on, and then if we're not going anywhere, we'll go to that aerial battle that we've that that we've we've seen the last few weekends, and hopefully we we get a bit of change out of that. But I just think with the side that picked, it'll be that early doors. We still have we we'll still have to kick very smartly and contest, um, and 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 then set piece is going to be everything. If we don't have, as you said, if we don't have our scrum solid, if we don't have uh, dominance in our line out attack, and try and steal the odd one, but dominance in line out attack. It's going to be a long day at the office. Yeah, I think for me, I just want to see them, and you, you said it there, it's just play a bit, especially from scrums. There was two scrums in the second test, eight minutes in, five yards out, and we hit Henshaw straight away, and he 
does an inside ball to Duhan who gets hit straight away. We don't even get over the gain line. You know, I'd be happy if they just hit Duhan and just let him run as hard as he can, get within two yards, and then you go pick and go. You tell us as forwards, it's so much easier if you've got momentum. As it was, they did a poor move, didn't try anything really. They got hit, and then the pick and go was, was snuffed out pretty quickly. And the second one was when there was the tackle that Faf did that was controversial. They had a man in the bin, South Africa. We've got your scrum five yards out. You've got a blind side, and I thought the Lions were poor there. It was a great opportunity to try and be, do something, not even go wide, wide, just manipulate Faf at the back of the line out, Conan going left, nine running right, or pop left, pass left um, from the nine. And I just think that, for me, was is, is something they have to see in this game to get the team on the front foot. Moving on now, we have JP Doyle joining us later to give a referee's perspective. But during the course of the series, subscribers to the official British and Irish Lions app, powered by Vodafone, are voting for their player of the series. So after Saturday night, the current leader is Duhan van der Merwe at one, Hamish Watson two, Maro Toji, Josh Adams and Courtney Laws is now there. Make sure you head over to the official British and Irish Lions app, powered by Vodafone, to cast your vote. Obviously, last test this week. So we'll find out who comes out on top. We are now selecting our greatest ever Lions 15 in the professional era. We have done the first 10 names, 1 to 10, but it's time to do our centres and back three, an area you know a lot about, Shawnee, and I'm sure you'll get some Irishmen in there. Six so far. Yeah. So far the team is Jason Leonard, one, Keith Wood, Tag Furlong, Martin Johnson, Paul O'Connell, Sam Warburton, Bellin next to me, Sean O'Brien, Toby Falatau, Connor Murray and Johnny Sexton. So, centres, Shawnee. Centers. Brilliant centres are playing. I'm going to remember Lions. that comment, by the way. You should remember it. By the way, you're not you're, even you're, in this discussion. Like, I know I'm not in that discussion. Don't get upset about actually, it. I wouldn't pick you anyway, even if oh, you were. Oh, wow. So you wow, know. I really rattled you with that one. <laughs> Look, we put you centers. in the team, you're next centers. to us, OK? Centers. Calm down. Centre, Scott Gibbs. Unbelievable. Oh, it was on the I mean, and seemingly an absolute legend off the field as well. He, he's he's one of the all time men. Dr. Jamie Roberts and Faz. Um, I am going to go with. Oh, that's a tough one now because Jamie Jamie had an unbelievable uh, what tour in 2013. I am going to be slightly different because I think there's two standout ones here and. If, the if we do the 13s we've got down here, we've got Jonathan Davis, Brian O'Driscoll and Jeremy Guscott. Now, Jeremy Guscott was unbelievable. There's only one. But he, but he also played in 93 and was incredible. But that was before the professional era. Yeah. There's only going to be one name at 13, Brian O'Driscoll. That's Brian O'Driscoll. Not even a question. Yeah. Uh, first name on the team sheet. But for me, I would pick Jonathan Davis at 12. I was just going to say the same myself. Because I think he I'd is probably pick Foxy at, at 12, yeah. I keep saying He's unbelievable. unbelievable on the yeah, two tours. Right, so that's it. But but I would say <laughs> Scott Gibbs is iconic. He only played, in well, mainly in 97, but he was so good in that series. Uh, he was just iconic. He was the catalyst for the, the, yeah. the Lions. So special mention, Jamie Roberts... Is, is did yeah, it over class as well. two tours. Class. Class. Brilliant, um, brilliant around the environment too. And Jeremy Guscott as well. But yeah. for me, Jonathan Davis at 12, Brian O'Driscoll at 13. They did do that in Australia. Yeah. And I think um, that, that's that's my new same. On to, on to the wingers. Um, so you are the same, yep. Okay, we agree on yeah, something. Wow. Yeah, we, uh, we, we're, we're um, moving on. Wingers, I think it's a straight shootout for me between Tommy Bowe, Jason Robinson and George North. We also have... John Fish. Bentley, Jason, or you, Ian Evans. Yeah. Uh, Ugo Monye and Anthony Watson. Well, it's pretty simple for me. I'm going with, you have Shane Williams there as well. Was unbelievable in South Africa. He played third test though. Yeah, but he's still unbelievable. Yeah, he was good. Freak. Um, I'm probably going to go with Jason Robinson though, just for his heroics in Australia. Doing. Um, you could play him at 15. Get him on the outside. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to leave him on the wing and I'm going to pick... Uh, I'm going to pick George North. Just a freak. And um, when he was on the field as well, it just gave you so much confidence and the way he went about everything. He's so strong going forward. Good in D. Brilliant in the air. So they're my two anyway. George see, North. See, for Robinson. me, I would have... First of all, was Tommy Bowe. 
I think he is a phenomenal rugby player. And 2009, he was brilliant. He was brilliant on the wing. He was brilliant in the build-up to it. And in 2013, I think he played two test matches. We yeah. played one. But yeah. I think he was, for the Lions... Uh, he then went to 13, I think. He did go to 13. And he was great Bring there. Bring Tommy as a reserve utility back. Yeah, well, I would have him as number one uh, there, just because his contribution to the Lions. Now, Jason Robinson and George North both scored great tries. Um, I think I'll go with George North. Um, this is just as a Lions player. That try he scored against Australia is one of the best tries ever by a Lions player. So, yeah, yeah to leave out Jason Robinson, I can't believe I'm doing it, but Tommy Bowe and George North for me on the wings. At fullback, we have a very hard one here. You've got Rob Carney, Liam Williams, Neil Jenkins, or Lee Halfpenny. With, with all of them putting a hand up in each series, really. Rob Carney, yeah. phenomenal in South Africa. Yeah. Um, injured, unfortunately, for the next tour. Liam Williams, amazing in New Zealand. You know, could put himself ahead if he plays well this weekend. Neil Jenkins, you know, with his kicking so important in South Africa, and Lee Halfpenny, man the series in Australia. Yeah, I'm I'm actually going with Lee Halfpenny here, just just because he's Mister Consistent. He kicked the Lions to victory um, as well. I don't think I think he missed one penalty on that tour, or maybe actually he didn't miss any on that tour. Um, but incredible, because um, he's not the biggest man in the world. But like extremely confident on dry ball, um, attacked really well. Very very brave, tough player. But um, I just think the point of difference was with with out of those names we mentioned there, Barney Jenkins obviously because he was what a legend he is um, off the boot. But I just think Lee Halfpenny for me. Oh, I agree. I think Rob, like, Rob won't be happy with me. I know that. I'll get yeah. a text off. Yeah, you haven't got him on the show yet either. It's between him and Rob. Well, he wouldn't. He, he actually didn't come on. He wouldn't yeah. come on. It's probably because you got a, both got a book out at the same time. <laughs> yeah, you know, he was fighting each other yeah. over it. Yeah. Um, you know, I picked Lee Halfpenny. Um, I think Lee Williams is brilliant. He, he may go ahead if he has a, a stormer man of the match in this, this test this yeah. weekend. Rob Carney uh, was so impressed with how he came into a test series under so much heat. High balls, he yeah. was young yeah. and he was phenomenal. But, but he's, uh, he's that, that's, that's his game though. That is his game. Like Yeah, still a young man, he's doing yeah. well. Okay, so big question. Who's your captain? Two two names or three names probably. Brian Driscoll, Warburton or Johnson? Who I think you I think in that whole team I, I think you probably have to go with Johnson. Why? Just because of the the people that's in it. Um, you need a bit more of... I don't know, I think you need a bit more... Are you that, saying you'd listen that, to him more than you'd lif- no, listen to... No, I wouldn't, because... Sam Warburton? Because Warby was, like, detailed and, like, built you up as well, but it was it was, it was was a different way. Like, he'd done all... You knew, you knew he had prepared 100% the best of his ability and you could follow his lead. I think Johnson just brings something different in terms of the bit of rawness that you need for the whole thing as well, and the bit of the bit of brute. <laughs> I like that. And the captain. You know, I'm, I'm going to say, spanning the works, you could put yourself as captain. You know, you were the first name down in your own mind. So well, why not? Why not put yourself as captain? <laughs> no, I'm not putting myself. You're not. Captain. No, I yeah. want to just play my own game. You know, He's, I like take the pressure off myself. Um, and coach, you'd have to, you'd have to pick Gatland. Because he's he's done what other coaches haven't done. Um, he's he's a proven proven track record. So surely that's a solid pick there from you. But back to this Lions series. Um, unfortunately, though, the officials have taken centre stage, and it's not really their fault, but the respective coaches that have dragged them into it. But here we're very lucky to have JP Doyle to give us a referee's perspective. JP, how are you? Good. How are you, lads? Thanks for having me on. We're very good. We're very good. Um, it's actually funny, JP, because during the week we said in our in our WhatsApp group we were saying <laughs> we were saying that you were going to come on. And <laughs> Goody's first message back to me was, "He cost me a prem medal." <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> Anything to say on that, Goody? <laughs> oh, I've nothing to say. It's just uh, you know. You've just made it awkward already, eh? Well, I guess. You know, we're never going to get guests again if you say that, Sean. Um, but JP... It's all right. It's, it's, uh, it's my want in life to be the awkward one in the room. <laughs> Is all forgiven, Goody, or what's the crack? 
it's all forgiven now. It's a long time ago, long time ago now. So we've all moved past that. So many things have happened. JP, you've uh, been in California, though. You've picked up a sun nicely. Yeah, I just, uh, just arrived back um, yesterday morning, um, back in the house here. So struggling a bit with jet lag and everything that entails, but a wonderful time out with the MLR for sure. And um, I'm not sure how much you've been uh, following, obviously, the series, but... Over the last few weeks, what have you sort of made of uh, the officials being dragged in into uh, everything? Because from, from my perspective, I just think it's been uh, it's it's been terrible, really, and, and a really very difficult position they've been put under. I think from sort of my my role in rugby and how I felt about, it, I just I just am, have huge empathy for the guys who are out there. You know, it's um, obviously conditions are tough for players and squads and management and referees as well, who are all cooped up and living under very strict COVID conditions and um, the games have ratcheted up pressure and, and situations that have been outside of maybe what normal refereeing is um, has added more fuel to a fire that's always there. You know, we always have refereeing issues in every in every game that's ever been refed. So it's, it's just been, I, I just feel really, my kind of heart goes out to the guys. And I think that's what's been really reassuring is how many people have come to the support of the referees, you know, whatever their role in rugby is, players, coaches, whatever else, how many people are saying, well, hold on a second here. We have to take a bit of responsibility around this. And it's not just all on a guy making decisions around gray areas in rugby, you know? So that's my, my, my big thing is feeling for the guys. And then really the love that rugby has shown in the wider scale in relation to the, the, the guys, Ben O'Keefe and to Nick Berry and to Matthew Reynal and to Marius Yonker down there. I think, I think that's been really good. JP, what did you make of Rassi's video? And I suppose behind closed doors, those kind of reviews happen, but to, to have it so public, publicly, is that the bigger is that the bigger thing here, I suppose? Um, because I know, obviously, as referees as well, you're trying to get better, you're trying to improve. Um, all those things are there every week for you. But what did you make of the whole, I suppose, debacle as such? Yeah, and I, I, I think that's it. Like, uh, my first kind of introduction to... Premiership rugby would have been in and around the Saracens guys going to training days um, when they were when Goody you were first starting out with them as well and Brendan Venter was there and he would always have referees in and he would run really strict training sessions with you guys about kick chase and players responsibilities and ruck entry and everything like that there's always been a huge focus and then as time went on there was more as we got more and more professional over the years there was more and more feedback from teams so the more feedback we look at, the more of the minutiae we got. So Razzie's video, I've had that off coaches. I've had that off my performances. We're not very happy. We think you were terrible. This is all you did wrong. And a lot of it can be subjective because it's gray and the ref can't say he's right and the coach can't say he's right because there's, there's two sides to the story. But the actual idea of putting those videos out there to express themselves has been around a long time. It's just perhaps I think the general feeling has been that you get it's more productive if that's not aired um, openly because it's not the ref wasn't right in everything he did in the game, nor is that video 100% correct. You know, there will be bits where you say, okay, we take this, but we don't take that. And it's been ever thus. And that's how we get better understanding between the referees and the coaches. And in the Premiership, they're they're very the coaches and feedback analysts are, are excellent. They're of the highest quality in the world, really, of how they do stuff. So I can only but tip the cap to those guys. So, do you think it's a dangerous road we're going down, though, in the sense that if you know there's always grey areas to rugby. You know, the ruck alone is always a grey area, and if we start challenging referees on every single call, then it's going to force them to go to the TMO more often. It's going to be slower games. It's just going to put more pressure on referees to, you know, worry about every single decision and stop the flow of a game. You're probably, and even Sean, but 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 Alex, you're in a super position to understand referees because of how far you stay away from stuff. So you're standing 30, 40 meters away playing fullback, for example, a lot of the time. You just react to a referee. He's put his arm up, okay, I need to cover the backfield. Oh, no, I'm coming up to do a kick to touch. We're pressing forward. We're on the tap and go, whatever it may be. Would it be fair to say that you actually don't take much notice in your position of what a referee does in a game because you can't see, you don't know, and p potentially you don't even care? Yeah, I mean, I, I do care. <laughs> but no, but you, your point is very valid, um, that I am very far away. It's it's big calls maybe that I, 
that I might worry about, you know, um, if it's an advantage, yes, stuff like that. But you're right, I'm not looking at the, the small things around the ruck, yeah. And, no, and, and on the flip side, then, I am. <laughs> yeah, correct. So, Sean, so yeah. you're so when I've been involved with you, it's there's more of a vocal entrance there. There's more I have to explain, I have to clarify for you what you can and can't go for because you can't see everything because you got your head in a ruck, you think and you're on the ball, simple you set a well. man in. So, there's more of an information exchange there. Yeah. Now, where refereeing was years ago is we were fallible, we made loads of mistakes, we didn't look at them too deeply because that's the way it was. When the TMO has come in now, we were saying, well, you could have got this decision right. So I'm, I'm slowly answering your question here. You could have got this decision right if you had to check this. The more we got our ARs involved, well, you could have got it right if you had input from your AR, from your TMO, from your fourth official, whatever it may be. So the more you invested in people getting the decision right, the higher the, the, the requirement was to get everything right. So if you want us to get everything right, this can be, not definitely, but this can be an outcome. Now, the absolute perfect scenario here is, well, just get referees who can make better live decisions. But we need to unearth them somewhere. We need to find mm. them under that rock which all referees live and pull these guys out and say, okay, you're now a world-class referee and we're going to put you in into these huge test matches. So it's the idea of referees were okay to be wrong. And now you're saying, well, he could have got it right. We should have checked that one. Yeah. But you never know what the one is. After 10 minutes, that call could be the big call or after 81, 82 minutes. So it's, it's one of these difficult positions to be in. The more we want to get right, the more we investigate it, the more pressure it is to slow it down and get it right. I, I, I actually think that's a great point because we're talking about a game being so slow. There was 14 minutes of TMO action, I suppose, in the last test. The game went on for over, what was it, two hours. Um, but at the end of the day, they're trying, to, they're trying to get these big decisions right in these massive test games. So it's actually funny when I, t- I, I haven't thought of it like that really. And if we didn't, if we didn't have the TMO, it'd be uproar between between both teams. I think. Well, but then you would accept if we didn't have the TMO. I'm not saying we look. We're not going to get rid of the TMO. I'm no. not saying we should. But people would accept. Well, look where the referee was standing. He couldn't see. So that's life. Let's get on with it. You've seen in football, it, it hasn't solved anything. The, the TMO isn't a panacea. It doesn't solve everything we need. It was brought originally to do tries, and then it was brought in to say, let's get the really big incidents. But sometimes a small incident is a really big incident. So if you were to go back to, and look at the referee, I, I've, everyone's saying it was a 62-minute, 64-minute half, which it was. But which decision would you have asked Ben to do quicker? Which one would you not want to have to check? Yeah. You know, the, the tackle in the air, the trip, talking to the captains because it was a fight, or the players who were down injured, or the stoppages we had... You know, it's, it's very difficult to know, well, where would you have stopped it? If you play that type of rugby, well, you're going to get that type of game. And, Goody, you've been involved in Saracen sides that have evolved over the years that were maybe very, very structured 10 years ago and now have so many attributes. But you have played that type of game at one stage in the development of Saracens where it was very, very structured, very successful, very good, won a lot of stuff. But you then evolved away from it to a large extent. Yeah, no, Sarah is, is a massive part of our development uh, in terms of going away from that structured, just kick chase uh, and being very organised and then developing our attack. But two things for me uh, is just give us a flavour in terms of how the coaches and when the coaches will come to you as a referee and sort of say, oh, I see the opposition doing this and can you watch out for this in the game? And secondly, can you tell us a little bit about Mathieu Reynal? From uh, let's talk about a lead out and then a lead into a week. So you do a game on let's call it an orthodox game Saturday at three o'clock. Um, normally you'll be travelling or whatever it is. Even if you're doing a Premiership game, if you're doing a game Manchester or Newcastle or Exeter, you'll be travelling for that day. So you come back. I, n- normally you get everything very quickly onto either onto your TV at home or you can get a download the nap on the laptop the next morning. Really the next morning or the first view of games, all you're looking at is, did I get those big decisions correct? Let me look at the really two or three big things. And it's for me, it was always my ego trying to you know, appease itself. I really hope I got those calls right because I look like a fool if I didn't. And sometimes it was a 50-50 guess and I was right or I was wrong. And you knew immediately, oh, I made a, I made a boo-boo there. I made a, a backside out of that. Or I've got it right. I'm lucky. Let's move on. It takes about 24 hours, and I'm sure it's the same for you guys, to step away from the game, cool down, 
relax. The the outcome of the game becomes slightly less important every 12 hours, 24 hours you get away from it. So on the Monday, you can actually go through the game. You can actually talk to your coach. You can talk to your boss, whatever it may be, or with the premiership boys that they're in Mondays at, at headquarters there. And you can go through the game in great detail and you can be honest and open and review through it. Very, very, very difficult to do it any before that. One, if it's a really big cup final day, you've probably gone out and had a couple of Diet Cokes or Rock Shandies in Ireland or whatever it may be. And you don't want to, you don't want to be looking at the game straight away. You need a bit of time. So by Tuesday, you've, you've got, it's about five hours to go through a whole game because you've got to watch it whole part whole. So five or six hours to do the whole thing, write a report, send it off. So by, by Monday evening, Tuesday morning, you're boxing off. The teams will come back to you with some more questions. Well, we thought this was wrong. We thought this was right. You'll have answered all them on Monday. There might be a little two and four, uh, back and forth over what you would disagree on, what you agree on. The, you can be talking to the forwards coach, the head coach, the defence coach, whatever it may be. Then Wednesday, you might step away from rugby for a bit. And then Thursday, Friday, for another Saturday games, the teams will get in touch with you and say, Saracens are playing London Irish. And they'll say to you, look, we're that, that squeaky guy in the scrum cap is never tackle release and he's on the ball and we got to get him off or whatever it is. And you go, right, okay, I, I, I see what you mean. Let's look at that. Or they'll go, look, the fullback, tackles everybody in the air, keep an eye on him, and you go, fine. There'll be one or two informations. You'll acknowledge them. By the way. And you'll always try and have them. <laughs> squeaky guy in the scrum hat? <laughs> you a big telephone voice on you, surely. Who's the squeaky guy in the scrum hat? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> oh, JP, JP, really? really? No, oh, I, call him, I call him Sir, actually. <laughs> sir. Because you, you're too out of puff to remember anyone's name. No, it's, and, and, and what you would do is if they brought up two or three really things that they're, they're, concerned about you'll share them between the teams mm -hmm. you say look london irish have brought up this or saracens have brought up that and look i'll be keeping an eye on that and mm -hmm. i think that's fair but it's also if if saracens brought up the london irish number seven you would equally pay attention to the saracens number seven that he behaves in the same way that they've asked of the other players keeping that balance it's not just looking at one mm -hmm. team so that's basically the lead out and lead in of a game. You'll also do your own research. You look at all the scrums for maybe the last two or three games, their line outs. Do they work a plus one at the line out? Are they off the top? You know, what's their what's their main way of going? Because if you're, as I normally am, cleaned up quite a lot of the back of the line. If you're standing at the back of the line out, they do an inside ball to a George North or something. He comes down that inside channel. You know, as much as I think I'm six foot and strong I'm, I'm really not and I just get smashed out of the way and you've just got to be careful there so you might look at a bit of play pattern uh, so that's really the, the game of, of how it goes in and out and I know there was a lot in the press about that but just to let people know that's kind of that's the agreement of how it works for all the teams and they're they're very aware and uh, Matthew as far right as uh, Matthew mm. yeah he's one of the, the really one of the most uh, charismatic guys I know off the, pitch, very, uh, off the pitch, very funny, very entertaining, great to go on tour with. I've, I've had two or three tours to Fiji with him, to South Africa, Argentina. He's been, he's a wonderful guy to go on trips with. Um, as a referee, he'll be, he'll be quite delineated in what he does, I would have thought. He's quite quiet and reserved on the pitch. He, he, he keeps the, the ref, respect the referee to a very high level. You might hear him say, look, I'm not yelling at you. Please don't tell me what to do as well. Mm. So he's, he's quite down the line with the guys, which I think will be the right approach for this weekend and the right attitude. He He's not a centre spotlight guy. He's not a big Mayfainer, as they would say in Ireland. He's just a genuinely good rugby bloke. He used to play for Perpignan as well. So he, he's a good rugby egg, um, but he'll be very much down the line in the way he does the game. It won't be very flashy in what he does on, on Saturday. Do you reckon do you reckon if things boil over again like they did last week, will he, he'll go straight to cards? He could be quicker to cards than some others because of the they've been working as a team of three for the for the he was on touch for the other two games. So the teams are aware of what he's going to tell them, plus he's aware of how the teams have been behaving. So if he does go to cards quickly, it won't be a surprise to the teams because they'll have been told what you've done here, here, and here is unacceptable. Or do you know what? We're really enjoying the way you're behaving. That's fine. Keep going. Mm. We thought it was really respectful last week. We thought it was superb. And that can get a bit more leeway. So it could go either way. The teams often, 
for good or for bad, I've done a couple of cup finals in my life. And normally they're a little easier than normal games because people behave better because they're afraid of letting down their own team. It's not that they don't want to push the ref. They're just so afraid of being the guy that gives away three, four penalties, a yellow card, and, and costs their team heavily. And referees themselves, you're really worried about making big impacts in cup finals, in knockout games, in one-off showpiece events. If you can, if you can drift away, it's the greatest result you can ever have. It's your best high. And if you can finish the last 20 minutes of the game just cruising around, well, that's fabulous. Yeah. So I think that I, I have a feeling this week the teams are under so much pressure, you're going to see some pretty good behaviour from both teams. And, and to be fair, there was good behaviour on display and the way they dealt with the refs was excellent in Test 2, wasn't it? I think you could see that with Sia and Alan Wynn and they were giving it them time and space. Yeah, yeah agreed. Um, JP, thank you very much for joining us. I think we all agree that uh, we just like to see uh, a game dominated by fantastic play or you know a Lions yeah. player or a Springbok player doing something uh, brilliant to win the Test match as opposed to hearing more about the referees. Um, but yeah. you know, me and Sean you know, both mate, agree. Ears, yeah, both agree they do a great job. Um, well, thanks so much for joining us and uh, we wish you well. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Cheers. JP. Thanks. So great to have JP on uh, to give us a perspective from the referees. It's been a pretty tough time for them. So hopefully this weekend will just be about the players. But on to the spring box. No PS theft to toy. Um, brought in Franco Mostart to go at six. Yeah. What, is, what's that, what does that change for them? Um, it just gives it gives them more options around the line-out and set-piece. You don't think it's a big loss? Ah, he is a big loss. He's a world player of the year. He's an unbelievable athlete. He's one of their their leaders as such in what he does on the field. He will be a big loss. But last weekend, when when the when they finished with that pack that they're starting this weekend, they were just incredible. And you know, it's very hard to defend that in terms of Maldi because you have options everywhere. And the second thing is just the sheer weight of the pack as well coming at you. So it's. I don't think he's going to be a massive, massive loss in terms of the way they're trying to play their game at the minute. Um, so, but I do think he will be a loss if the Lions play rugby because he's that mobile, he's extremely quick for a big man, uh, extremely physical, and I just don't think they'll have that in terms of if, if the Lions keep the ball and keep moving them around a little bit, he will be missed in that, in, 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 in that aspect. But if they go to this kick game and this slow game that, that we've seen last weekend, he won't be missed. But the little man with the long blonde hair, he's going to be missed, I think. I think he will be. Um, I think Reinach is a wonderful athlete. He's so quick. He's great in terms of support lines, scoring tries. He can kick really well. But um, speaking to a friend of mine who played with him, Montpellier, he's, he says that, you know, pressure comes on a bit. He can hit the odd bad kick and he's a bit erratic. And I think that's the difference. Faf is the energizer bunny. He brings so much to the team, his enthusiasm, his pace, the tempo at times, but also his kicking game, the little kicks as yeah. well as the high balls. Yeah. He's so important for them. Yeah. And defensively, he's a nuisance. So, um, while I think uh, Peter Sefter Toy they can get past, uh, I think Faf will be a big loss to mm. them. But hit me with it. Decider now. I want your prediction. What's going to happen? Lions, <coughs> if they play, and and no, no, not if they play. Just no, Lions if they if they play and express themselves will win the game. And I think it'll be. Uh, I think it will be. Twenty six, twenty two. To the Lions. Well, as long as they play off scrums, I'll be happy. Uh, and I think the Lions will win in a very close game. I think the bench will have a big impact as, as, they, as they have. Liam Williams to be man of the match and the Lions to win 22... No, 21 to 19. Ooh, very tight. Very tight. Very tight. Very tight. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's House of Rugby Powered by Vodafone. Thank you for watching or listening. Shawnee, great to see you. Sorry I was late. Will you forgive me? We'll see. Cheers, guys. <laughs> You've been watching the House of Rugby.